Nixon, uh, that uh, Reagan could have been impeached before he left, but that the press more or less acted very restrainfully. And as, as in the case of Nixon. But why don't, why don't you and your, your colleagues who come out for Burundi and for Timor come out for things that are so close, not only at, ho at home, but at heart and in the middle of the... Of the which things? Well, the, the way a corrupt government is, is acting, I mean, with a minister like me. I spend, I spend half my life on that topic. But did I you mean, I spend on this special yes, topic? Yes, in fact, I have a book about it. Uh, I have a book specific, largely about the uh -huh. Iran-Contra scandals, which mm -hmm. came out in 1988. And, and yeah. the reason I have a book is because I'm, you know, two or three days a week uh, somewhere giving talks about it or uh, on the radio about so it or something else. So it's still possible that, that the Iran-Contra scandal... Uh, no. It's a cover-up. I mean... Just like Watergate, uh, it's a cover-up. I mean, there, there came a point yeah. when it was impossible to conceal what was going on. I mean, take the Iran Contra uh -huh. In some I don't agree with you about Watergate, but let's not uh, okay. go on to that. Mm. Uh, on, uh, the Iran, let's take the Iran Contra scandal. Mm. Uh, everything that came out of the Iran Contra scandal, except the details, I mean, the general things that came out were perfectly well known before. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have a book in 1985. Mm -hmm. uh, which describes Oliver North's role in yeah. organizing illegal uh, arms sales to the Contras. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not because I have any special knowledge, because it's mm -hmm. because it was public knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a book in 1983, uh, that's years before the Iran-Contra scandal, mm -hmm. which describes uh, U.S. arms sales to Iran via Israel, mm -hmm. uh, based on public information. There was nothing secret about it. The only th no. fundamental thing that came out of the Iran-Contra scandal was that these two things were somehow connected, possibly, which is a minor point. Uh, why did it ever break through? Well, it broke through because in October 1986, mm -hmm. a plane was shot down carrying an American mercenary. At that point, it was impossible to conceal that half of it anymore. Uh, the other thing that happened is uh, the uh, Lebanese and then the Iranian uh, the Iranians released the fact that the National Security Advisor was running around Tehran giving out Bibles and chocolate cakes. Mm -hmm. Well, at this point, well, you can't stop pies. talking about it anymore. Okay, so in fact, something broke through which was unconcealable. Mm -hmm. At that point, exactly as in the case of Watergate, begins the cover-up operation. The purpose is to narrow it, to narrow the issue mm -hmm. so that it only deals with personalities, uh, not with institutions. See, there's, there's after all, see, if you take a look at the things that were not looked at in the Iran-Contra scandal, it's extremely interesting. For example, take the Iran side. An obvious, they began their investigation from 1985. Mm. Well, an obvious question is, what was the United States doing with regard to Iran before 1985? Mm. Answer, it was sending arms to Iran via Israel. Mm -hmm. But if you look at that uh, matter, mm. then of course uh, the wrong answers come up. It must be that there was some long-term planning involved. And of course there was, and you don't want that to be understood. <coughs> what you want to, the population to believe is that there's a sort of one overzealous patriot who got out of control. And the point is, even the most magnificent system can but have I an overzealous patriot. Uh, I'm sorry, but you, That's you, a can't, cover you can't have it both ways. You can't say on the, on the one hand, uh, it, it, it suddenly came to light because, uh, well, because of the, the, what the press did. On the other hand, and you say uh, it, it was personalized in the, f in the shape of Mr. North and, and some others. I can certainly say that because it's true. Yes, yes but the first of all, it's not it didn't come to light because of what but the press did. It was sorry, sorry, sorry. May, may I have my question? Um, uh, uh, you can't say that at the same time as you say that apparently there were other things hidden before it came to light. There's still there's no, that's not there's my still point. There's look, not look the the information uh, the information on the. Uh, the U.S. sale of arms to Iran via oh. Israel was public in the early 1980s. It's just that nothing was done with it. Oh. Uh, it was public, and if people wanted to really dig, they could find it out, like I found it out and, in fact, wrote about it. Oh. Uh, it didn't, wasn't very hard, in fact. You could do it rather easily. Oh. Uh, but it was nevertheless suppressed in the sense that it was not part of public consciousness. It was just little tidbits here and there from which you could put together that oh. was happening. As far as the uh, sale of... Uh, uh, the illegal uh, supply of arms in violation of the congressional legislation. There was enough information around to put together that that was happening and even to identify it as being organized by Colonel North out of the White House. Mm -hmm. In fact, as I say, I wrote about it in 1985. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, although there's a level at which the facts were there, there's a much more important level in which the consciousness wasn't there because these were bits and pe You can't expect people to deal with the world in the manner of 
uh, researchers trying to penetrate uh, the deceit of a propaganda system. No doubt you can do it if you really mm -hmm. put your mind to it, but it's not there unless you see it's a headline. So you how can they cope with it? By people like you, by reading people like exactly. you? Exactly. The thing is... How many are there people like you well, who no. put these things together? Not some, and the ones who are there are oh. under fantastic demand. Mm -hmm. so, so how so dumb do the American people stay without people like you putting well, things together? it's not that they're dumb. You know, there's nothing dumb I'm about... Uninformed. Not uninformed. Well, you know, I mean, th there are many people who are very well informed, much better informed than the press. For example, if you read letters to the editor's columns mm -hmm. in newspapers around the country, you quite typically find more informed commentary about Central America than you'll find in the editorial columns and the opinion columns uh, and in the From people that have found it themselves? Yes, from ordinary people. But you said that the information was easy to be gathered because the, the press gave the information without... Easy is a funny word for it. You know, it's, it, if, if you're well, willing to relatively. read, like for example, well. I found out about the arms flow through Iran by reading well. transcripts of the BBC well. uh, and by reading uh, an interview somewhere with an Israeli ambassador in one city and reading something else in the Israeli press. Now, okay, the information is there, hmm. but it's there to a fanatic, you know, somebody hmm. who wants to uh, spend a substantial part of their time and energy exploring it and comparing today's lies with yesterday's leaks and so on. That's a research mm -hmm. job. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it just simply doesn't make any sense to ask the uh, general population to dedicate themselves to this task on every issue. Mm. Uh, so the information was there in a sense, but it was hidden in a much more important sense. Mm. Now, in October 1986, when the plane was shot down and a mercenary was captured, mm -hmm. then it's impossible to keep it quiet. So something came out in the real sense, meaning headlines, you know, something that people could see. Well, at that point begins, you could predict, begins the cover-up operation. The cover-up operation is an effort to narrow the scope of the inquiry so that it does not reach issues of institutional structure, so that people don't really understand what's happening. Mm -hmm. What you want to do is demonstrate that there's, w that there's uh, an individual who's at fault, maybe because he's a crook, or maybe because he's overzealous, or too much of a patriot, or whatever it may be. Just let's focus well, it on his the links to the CIA will, couldn't be denied at that time. Yeah, but let's, let's focus it. Right, sometimes you say, well, if the yeah. CIA is out of control, but anything except saying that yeah. what's true, yeah. that these are long-term plans which are mm -hmm. being carried out for reasons. Yeah. So, for example, throughout the entire Iran-Contra hearings, the population, I mean, if you could think about it, you could figure it out, but no one ever said mm -hmm. uh, the, a very obvious thing. Why did the Reagan administration, uh, why was it forced to such extraordinary clandestine terror operations. The United, the, the United States in the 1980s set up an international terror network of a novel kind. Uh, and it's important mm -hmm. to understand the other countries hired terrorists. The United States hired terrorist states. Uh, if you look at what came out in the Iran-Contra hearings, mm -hmm. uh, there was a network of, of mercenary states, Taiwan, South Korea, Israel, Saudi Arabia as a funder and so on, all integrated in a complicated way to carry out a terrorist attack against Nicaragua. Now that's something new in history. Mm -hmm. uh, why did something new in history in the annals of international terrorism develop in the 1980s? Well, there are several reasons. One crucial reason uh, is because the population was so dissident that the government was driven underground. Uh, and it was driven underground. It, was, it therefore had to carry out the activities in a secret from the public, though of course known to Congress and known to the media. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that's a very important insight for the American people to understand. It's important for them to understand that their government regards them as an enemy, and that if they're too dissident, their government is going to go underground and carry out clandestine terror operations mm -hmm. on a massive scale. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, as I say, uh, if you uh, think it through, you can see these things, but to ask people yes. to think it through is difficult. But at the risk of... Um, uh, being rebuked by you for personalizing things too much. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was a president who happened to be a person as well, but he was a president of the United States. One of the things that was important at the time was whether he was informed or not. And, and although uh, you uh, say that there was so much information flowing around and around, one thing wasn't made clear at all, that was the position of the president. Yeah. And that was rather important for an American, I think, no, and for the American, it wasn't. So, no, I think that's again... It doesn't matter who is the president or well, what. It, sometimes it does. Right. But you see, there, there's a kind of an open secret that most American citizens understand, but the educated classes try to conceal. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and the open secret is that Ronald Reagan was a formal executive. The United States effectively didn't have an executive for the last eight years. Uh, and the population was they generally quite a wise. Uh, they voted for him. I mean, well, a, a minority of them, about 28 or 30 percent of the electorate, voted for him twice. Mm -hmm. If you look closely, you'll discover that of the people who vote, let's take the 1984 mm -hmm. election, where he won, he got about a little over 30 percent of the vote. Uh, of the people who voted for him, by about three to two, they were they hoped that his program would not be enacted. Yes, that's, now, all right. that's now, all right. They voted Nixon for the, for the wrong reasons no, as it's well. Not the wrong, said that see, I think I think it's not the wrong reasons. I think the population recognized mm. what the educated classes refused to concede mm. that they're electing a symbolic figure. Uh, it's of no interest whether the, it's, uh, it, in England, let's say, mm -hmm. it's of no particular interest whether the Queen of England knows what government policy is. It's not the same thing. They've it's, got a prime minister. Uh, but, I mean, uh, yes, but you see. Leading a party, yes, like the American uh, president except does. The, you see, except I think the important thing to understand is that there was a sort of an innovation mm -hmm. in democratic theory that took place in the 1980s in the United States, namely a symbolic figure was elected to the executive office. That's a magnificent way to marginalize the population. Yes, okay. I, now, I, I the appreciate population the cynicism, is pretty well but, but It's not cynicism, it's, it's recognition of reality. No, 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 but you can't print every day in the New York Times as, as uh, when you print the name Reagan, remember this is the president you vote for fun. I mean, it's... Uh, it's not vote for you, fun, it's because you didn't have a choice. Well, what you described no. was fun. No, it's not fun. Uh, I mean, it's, there's nothing funny about it. He's a figure, had There's nothing say. funny That's, about uh, it. It's, it's very serious. Mm -hmm. uh, one, of the way, uh, one of the ways of marginalizing the population Mm -hmm. is by depriving the formal mechanisms of substance. Now, uh, you have to pretend that they're substance. Therefore, there was a great deal of focus on exactly the issue you raised. Mm -hmm. Did the president know or did he remember that there had been such and such a policy? When did he know? Now, most of the population didn't care because mm -hmm. they knew it didn't matter. Uh, whether the president was informed. I mean, the pres they understand that the president is someone who looks at the teleprompter and reads his lines. Mm -hmm. uh, and incidentally, in retrospect, the media admit this. Notice what happened to Ronald Reagan. Uh, after he had done his job, namely reading his lines and smiling and telling a few jokes for eight years, uh, he disappeared. Right. So, for example, at the recent North trial, it was revealed that... He will uh, be re-elected to show four well, years. It, re it was revealed at the North mm -hmm. trial that Reagan had... the words that came out of his mouth mm -hmm. had been false. Nobody even cared because his role was finished. He played a symbolic role. It's now over. He can enjoy himself in California. That's exactly and what I mean. He was a, He should have been taken seriously right. when he was in office. He didn't know what was going on. <laughs> I mean, you, you read the memoirs. About How do you know that the other people knew? The, 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 oh, the yeah. high officials that he picked, the minister, right. his cabinet that he picked, they, they could be easily uh, uh, changed for other people as except well. Except that we, see, we have a good deal of information about what people knew. Mm. By now, a lot of information has come out at the trials and so on. And uh, George Schultz. Mm -hmm. and Casper uh, Weinberger and William Casey and Elliot Abrams and many others mm -hmm. knew very well what they were doing. Occasionally they would inform Ronald Reagan and sometimes he would sit in on a meeting and so on. But there's no particular reason but to believe that he played any decision-making role in this of any significance. That's part of the mythology. Uh, he was there in order to marginalize the population. And much of the population is well aware of this, and by now it's even pretty well conceded. I, I don't, I don't get you really. Let, let me put it this way: there is a president of the United States, mm -hmm. uh, voted in by a minority of the people. Ronald Reagan accepted a certain role. Yeah. His role was to read the lines that were written for him by the rich folks. Yes. That's what he's done all his but life. But you are giving uh, the other people the excuse. I'm not giving anybody by, an excuse. By, by there's no him. excuse. There's no excuse. There's a description. Let's give an accurate description. Mm -hmm. The accurate description mm -hmm. is he had only the dimmest understanding and knowledge of what policy were. He delegated, uh, he, he, was, he was playing a role that he was assigned to play. Look, the Queen of England opens Parliament by reading a political program. So that's a constitution. No, only that's, asks, that's something different as uh, a system. Yeah, but yeah, let's see, what's interesting about mm -hmm. the 1980s is that the United States moved a step towards a constitutional monarchy. But they didn't declare and, themselves. Yeah, yeah and, that, and therefore what you want to do is help people understand what mm. is happening, whatever the words may be. Whatever the words may be, mm. certain things are happening. Uh, and one of the things that's happening is there was a distancing of the formal act of signing an X mm -hmm. um, every four years from the actual decision making. Now, that there's always been a distance, but the distance moved a step further in the 1980s, and that's important to understand. Uh, I should say that much of the population understood it quite well. Did you uh, vote yourself? 
Yeah, I, I usually, I mean, I, you know, voting is a matter of a, ch yeah, I sometimes vote, I sometimes do. Because you expect something from the American president. Well, I think there's marginal, you know, there's sort of 10th order differences between mm. the parties. I mean, in, in effect, you've got two factions of the business party. I mean, to see how exactly what this means, mm -hmm. look at the, take a look at the programs of the two parties. Uh, in, let's take the 1984, in the 1988 election, there were no issues, everyone agrees. Mm -hmm. So let's take the 1984 mm -hmm. election where there were some issues still. Mm -hmm. What were the issues? Well, the uh, Republicans were essentially the party of Keynesian growth. They said, let's keep up the big government spending, the growth of big government, massive intervention in the economy, and it'll all work out. Mm -hmm. The Democrats were the party of fiscal conservatism. Mm -hmm. They said, look, we're getting into real problems, too much of a budget deficit, too much of a, you pick the issue, and ex aside from some statistical blips now and then, the population was strongly opposed to the Reagan policies. And for various historical and other and reasons. Which part of the population? I mean, uh, the majority uh, of the population. Uh, for example, take take. Did they care enough? I mean, oh, sure. They, well, you know, care, how do you, there's no measure of care. Mm. Uh, but uh, uh, pick the issue. So let's take, say, uh, military versus mm. social spending. Mm. The population preferred social spending to military spending by large margins. In fact, the majority of the population was even willing to accept higher taxes, which is unusual if they're used for welfare, education, the environment, and so on. Now, while this was true of the majority of the population, the margins were rather large, incidentally. Uh, the Democrats and Republicans combined on dismantling much of the welfare state and uh, uh, turning the uh, funding to uh, uh, armaments, which is basically a subsidy to high technology industry. That was counter to the popular will. Uh, and there was a marginal possibility, in my view, there was a slight, there was a likelihood, a small likelihood, that the Democrats in 1984, because of their fiscal conservatism, might be more responsive to the popular mood than the Republicans. Uh, on, let's take, say, the Contra issue, which is a major issue. Uh, actually, on the Contra issue, by 1986, about 80 percent of what are called leaders in polls, which includes business executives and political figures mm -hmm. and so on, about 80 percent of them were opposed to the Contras. Uh, the Republican administration, not Reagan, but the Republican administration mm -hmm. was way off, virtually off the spectrum. I mean, they were pursuing a policy which most of the business elite, the they were able to continue it for two years. Well, they were able to continue it, uh, uh, but most, a good bit of the elite was really opposed. In fact, the majority was opposed to it because they wrote it as not cost so effective. So there is no elite worthwhile cooling in, uh, in no, the No, there's, look, within any elite, there's always going to be differences of mm. opinion. And we happen to have a slightly anomalous situation in 86, 87, where one segment that happened to be sitting in power mm. wanted to pursue a policy which was kind of at the extreme of the legitimate spectrum. Now, that poli that's why you had the conflicts with Congress mm -hmm. and so on. That's why you had the clandestine operations. Uh, most of the powerful groups mm -hmm. in the country wanted to perf uh, carry out more cost-effective means to destroy Nicaragua. They understood that economic warfare and uh, ideological warfare and so on should be sufficient to prevent a tiny dependent country from surviving. It's a mistake to insist upon terror, which just arouses disturbances among the population, mm. and, you know, a bad image, and too costly, and so on. Now, I, I thought it was important mm. to shift to the uh, less murderous means of trying to destroy Nicaragua. I don't think they would do it at all, mm. but I think there's a marginal difference between sending terrorists and trying to force people to starve through embargo. There's a marginal difference there, and I think that you know the small differences in American policy translate into very large differences for the victims. Mm -hmm. It's a powerful country. Yeah, yeah. And that's, those are the kind of situations in which uh, political engagement makes sense. That's not because you, you can say that the Americans don't know their own power and might. Oh, they, well, it depends who you mean, but uh, well, the planners, American, top well, planners certainly know their own power. Uh, I mean, their power, in fact, is, uh, they have yeah. a rational assessment of their own power. Now, let's come back to your book for a moment, if you, you and Herman's book. Um, uh, what do you really want to achieve? You want to achieve uh, uh, a better information of the people? No, because you say it's not a question of information. They know enough. Mm -hmm. You want to you want to uh, to to have them uh, able to put things into perspective on the basis of the information they get. How would they get it when when there is a uh, a corrupt power. I mean, the people on the top are, are corrupt. They're trying to to hide information and at least trying to 
to hide their plans as long as possible. That's what, what you more or less say. And when the press doesn't have uh, more than the information, at least not the power to combine things. Uh, I, well, I, uh, uh, there's a lot of, uh, we were not, we're, we're talking a bit at cross purposes, I think, because I don't agree with a lot of the assumptions you made. For uh, example, I think it's a viewer assumption. Well, I don't, uh, well, maybe we're not communicating uh, properly, but uh, when I say that information is there, I don't mm. mean that the population has the information. Mm. For example, information was there about the U.S. sale of Iran, of arms to Iran. Excuse me, you, you, you were saying that it was printed. See, but, but let me stress mm. again what I said before. Information mm. can be printed and not be available to people. See, the information that's mm. printed is available to assiduous researchers who spend a substantial part of their lives and energy to try mm. to put it together and see what it means. Uh, for most of the population, the information basically isn't there. So, for example, when I read... If you're really an assiduous researcher, you'll know that uh, the Pentagon, Secretary McNamara, mm. took credit afterwards. He was asked by Congress, what was the point of sending arms to Indonesia? Mm -hmm. Did it pay dividends? He said, yes, it paid dividends. You'll know that there was a House committee uh, investigation which pointed out that the connections that the United States established with the Indonesian military in those mm. years helped but to lay the background for the Excuse me, that, no, that wasn't the question. The, no, the question is, how do the American people yeah. get as informed and capable of putting things together as you are, and as privileged as you Somebody are? Somebody has to do it, because, you see, uh. look, look what I've just sketched. In order to understand what was going on in the Iran-Contra mm. hearings, you have to know things like what happened in Chile, what happened in Indonesia, what are the classic policies for dealing with a government you're trying to overthrow? Mm. What was the Israeli ambassador saying? What was uh, David Kimchi and Yaakov Nimrodi mm -hmm. saying? Uh, you have to be able to sort of see all of that and see, get, put the information together and say, aha, this fits into exactly the classic mm. pattern. When you've done that, it all falls together. Mm. But uh, you cannot expect uh, ordinary people to do that work. So you ask what our book was about. Well, our book is about helping, not, not really explaining particular cases, mm -hmm. but trying to help people understand yes, yeah. the way the system distorts yeah. the facts so that they can then compensate for the distortion in whatever new cases come along. Then I understand that it's a, it's a laudable work, but it's a very lonely work, and you, you go, don't go out from the assumption that everybody will read that book. I mean, I'm not, I'm not yes, mocking you, on the no. contrary. Mm -hmm. but, but how, in general, I mean, you, <laughs> now we're personalizing you, I mean, uh, it's, it's your book, okay, but there's one book, maybe there are three others, and on the Iran Contra Affairs, maybe ten others. But is that enough? And it's not, it's not an institutional answer. I mean, how do the American people in general, uh, which have to do with this situation that you described already, like you said, f roughly from the Second World War, how do they cope with, a, with a power, their own power, that's getting more powerful and powerful every day, well, and it's is having its influence well, on the world. First of all, I think there are competing, you know, society is a complex place, and there are quite competing things developing in the United mm. States. At a sort of um, formal, in, in terms of formal politics, mm. there's a narrowing of the system. In terms of informal politics, there's a diversification and spreading mm. of the system. So, for example, the country is much more dissident than it was in the 1960s. So the time when I asked myself the question that you're asking me now mm. was in 1963. I was asking myself, what's the I'm point? I'm 26 years behind. Well, I, I frankly asked myself at that point, what is the point of my spending day after day mm. talking to some group of people in the living room where they invite two hostile neighbors mm -hmm. to listen to me talk about Vietnam? What is the point of my going to a church uh, where there are eight people, uh, three of them uh, drunks mm. and two of them the organizers and one or two other well, who might Jesus be Jesus Christ started like that. Well, look, I mean, the point is lots and lots of people were doing mm. that. Uh, and over the years, the country changed. Mm. Uh, the United States changed in many, many ways. It's a very different country from what it was 25, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. Now, when I give talks, I can assume an audience, first of all, a very substantial audience, like it's thousands, it's not two or three mm -hmm. people, mm -hmm. and also a, at a totally different level of understanding. I mean, the kind, I can now talk to audiences, and it's not just me, it's true of others too. Mm. I can talk to audiences who understand the world at a level of sophistication far beyond what was true in the 60s. Uh, furthermore, it's penetrated into many aspects of life. Uh, there have been quite, uh, all across the board, let me take an example that's remote from this, just mm. to indicate. Uh, the United States has gone 200 years since it was founded without facing the question, what happened to the native population? Mm -hmm. uh, up until the 1960s, 
the relation of the United States to its native population was cowboy and Indians. I mean, there were the Indians out there, you gotta shoot them. That's the way I grew up. Mm. Even children play Me games too. and shoot the yeah. Indians. Yeah, we saw the same. Well, okay, now, in, the, uh, in fact, there was a denial, even in the scholarly profession, mm. that the native population was there. It was pretended, even in the, in the anthropological literature, that the Native Americans were uh, hunter-gatherers, hunter basically no civilization. Uh, that's a convenient belief, because then under English common law, they had no right to their land. Uh, in the 1970s, under the impact of the changes that had taken place mm -hmm. in the population, mm -hmm. for the first time in 200 years, it became possible to face these issues. Mm -hmm. Now, the issues aren't solved, you know, but that's a kind of, if you want, a sort of a, a massive cultural change. It's possible to face events of our own past and our own nature. Uh, that's quite important. Uh, the same is true, say, of feminist issues. There's probably nothing that has changed mm -hmm. the cultural landscape so much as the feminist movement. Mm -hmm. Very significant in all sorts of ways. Well, you know, that happened in the 1970s, and it was a result of the opening of minds and the questioning and the freshness and so on that developed in the 60s out of the civil rights movement and the peace movement. And this has happened in many, many areas. Mm. As a result, uh, and, and there is a lot of dissenting politics. In fact, that is, let's compare Reagan and Kennedy. Uh, I use Reagan in a symbolic sense. I don't mean the individual, I mean the administration. Mm -hmm. uh, take Reagan and Kennedy. Now they faced, as they came into office, they faced somewhat comparable situations. Uh, Kennedy in Vietnam, Reagan in Central America. Uh, Kennedy in Vietnam, what had happened at that time was that uh, the United States had instituted a classic Latin American style terror state in South Vietnam in 1954 mm. to try to disrupt the Geneva Agreements. Uh, by 1959, it had elicited resistance. Its terror had elicited resistance. By that time, 70 or 80,000 people had been killed in South Vietnam, not mm. a small thing. It elicited resistance, and the government, which had no basis, began to collapse. Uh, then Kennedy came into office. Uh, now, notice that something similar was happening in Central America when the Reagan administration came in. The effort to control El Salvador and Guatemala by force was beginning to erode. It elicited a lot of resistance. Things looked very problematic. The main base of U.S. power, Nicaragua, had collapsed. Uh, the National Guard was driven out, despite mm -hmm. the efforts of the Carter administration to keep it there. Didn't look as if that was going to be controlled. Now, how did Kennedy react and how did Reagan react? Well, Kennedy reacted very simply. He attacked South Vietnam. In 19, he first of all increased the number of American soldiers. Secondly, in 1962, 61 and 62, he simply sent the American Air Force, not mercenaries, mm. the American Air Force, to start bombing South Vietnamese villages in an effort to drive, actually they were attempting to drive seven or eight million people into concentration camps called strategic hamlets to separate them from the guerrillas. Mm -hmm. When that didn't work, uh, they uh, turned to trying to establish some government would invite us in and finally just invaded outright. Now, what did the Reagan administration, and why could they do that? They could do that because nobody cared. You, know, mm -hmm. you, 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 you couldn't get two people together in a room to discuss what was mm -hmm. happening. They do whatever they feel like doing, that's fine. You know. Now let's go to the 1980s. Uh, the Reagan administration came in. The first thing they did in February, mm -hmm. one, three weeks after they came into office, they leaked a white paper, official white paper, which was a duplicate of the 1960s white paper. It was an announcement that they were going to intervene in Central America directly. Mm -hmm. uh, all the usual stories, I mean, you know, the Russians, and that's because of the popular movements of these periods, which, contrary to what's stated, expanded in the 1970s mm -hmm. and expanded even more in the 1980s and functioned, but through informal politics. But and what you say now, compatible with the fact that so many people don't even bother to vote. I mean, what we learn here right. from a distance is a total lack of interest, uh, uh, a, a sometimes complete form of cynicism, which, is, which run, runs country to what you were just saying. I mean, I share your hopes and your idealism, maybe, and your optimism, but is it based on facts? I mean, yeah, what you say is based facts. on facts, but is, it, is the impact based on facts? Oh, sure. I, I mean, I, I uh, told you some crucial facts. Uh, I think that's very str See, it's true that people, the voting goes down. Uh, not only does voting go down, there's mm. an even more significant fact. I don't know how well it's known. Mm -hmm. uh, the rate of re-election of incumbents mm -hmm. has gone way up. Uh, so if you look at Congress, for example, the uh, uh, many people run uncontested, mm -hmm. no contest. But uh, mo in fact, uh, I think I forgot the exact figure, but I think it was over 95 percent, mm -hmm. maybe even higher than that, of incumbents, people already mm -hmm. in office, won in the last election. 
In fact, somebody pointed out that the rate of change in a Politburo is now faster than in Congress. Uh -huh. Now, what does it prove? What, what that, uh -huh. See, that indicates what I was describing. Uh -huh. There's a decline in, in the significance of formal politics. At the same time, there's an increase in the significance and scale of informal politics. I mean, people couldn't care less who is, who is in, in well, Congress. Well, it's not that they couldn't care less. It's of, it's of more marginal significance. Mm. Uh, uh, much of the population is just not engaged. That's certainly mm. true. But larger and larger parts are engaged, active, dissident. The ground and, you mean. and they do things. They, and you can see the effects. The effects, for example, mm. are that the Reagan administration could not do what the Kennedy administration did. And that's quite significant. How uh, do you, how uh, let's uh, even take, take even yeah. the case of East Timor, mm -hmm. you know, where the, or the, which is yeah. extremely interesting. I mean, here's a major massacre. Uh, and nobody knew about it because oh. it was totally suppressed. I mean, this is a case where it was literally totally suppressed. Uh, reporting actually declined from a fairly high level as the aggression continued. Reporters were refused by the Indonesian government. That so. was not the point. Uh. It was you didn't have to, be to, in, to get into the country to read the Australian press or to read the human mm. rights reports or to, in fact, look, I went, let me tell you the extent to mm. which this proceeded. I actually went to the point, si since American reporters would not interview Timorese refugees in Lisbon and Australia, they simply wouldn't do it because there's no gain in that. Mm. I actually went to the point of bringing refugees on my own, paying for them to come to the United States, mm. including, you know, Catholic priests and recent refugees and so on, hoping that if I could get them into an editorial office, somebody would listen to them. I mean, that's the extent to which it reached. Well, it finally got to the point where the thing began to break through. It began to break through into peace movement circles, into sectors of Congress, into only conservative sectors of Congress. There's nothing to do with liberal conservative here. Uh, conservative sectors of Congress, uh, uh, general parts of the population, parts of the press, which became appalled. You know, when people learn what's happening, they become appalled. Mm. That's the reason why these things are secret. Mm. Enough happened so that it became, there was enough pressure put on the U.S. government so they at least let the Red Cross in. Mm. Now that probably saved tens of thousands of lives. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not an insignificant mm -hmm. fact. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and this is because of the possibilities of informal politics, mm -hmm. even when there's a total press blackout. Now there are lots of things like that. And you know, you can say it's not enough. Well, I agree, it's not mm. enough, but mm. it's a lot more than there was. I'm not blaming you ago. for not trying or for. Uh, well, you see, I, I think there are very few things that I can think of in my lifetime mm. or anyone's lifetime that correspond to the having participated in saving tens of thousands of lives. Mm. Uh, I, I uh, you know, I'm, as I say, I'm very uh, self-critical. In fact, harshly self-critical. Mm -hmm. I've written about this for getting involved so late, but once you can get involved, you can make a difference. Uh, and no, I think there's much more general. I see. I think the real, if I understand you correctly, what you're driving mm -hmm. to is a more long-term issue. Mm -hmm. Well, I, th I agree with that. I mean, I think that in the long term, uh, there should be attempts to bring together informal and formal politics. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see substance in the democratic system. Mm -hmm. because, uh, that requires institutional change. Uh, because you surmise that um, still many parts of the world where the Americans could could, could do harm. Well, it's going to continue. I mean, uh, what we're doing is putting. Uh, we're, we're putting band-aids on cancers. Uh, now it's, uh, sometimes you want to put a band-aid on the cancer, but you'd like to get to the source too. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think there are lots of options in a country like the United States uh, for, uh, for, first of all, I think, I mean, look, the media are better than they were 25 uh, years ago. The, I, I was going to ask uh, exactly at this moment a question whether you consider yourself uh, also as a product of the media because, well, all the things that you said which differ. Well, of course. I mean, I keep too. learning yeah. all the time. You know, yeah. you keep learning all the time about things that you misunderstood. Uh, yeah. It's not just a product of media. I mean, as, for example, as secret government documents are declassified, mm -hmm. uh, usually 30, 20, mm -hmm. 30 year gap, mm -hmm. you begin to learn things mm -hmm. and you can see, how could I have not understood that 30 but years ago? But did the media you know? make you two? Did they make me? Yes. As a person? As a personality? Yeah, they certainly helped shape me. I mean, mm. I'm part of my culture and civilization. Mm. Uh, you, you try to develop a critical and a critical eye, mm. but, uh, you know, uh, I mean, just as in science, mm. you know, you sort of do the best you can. You know you're always being misled, even just as in science. Mm. You can always do better. So you work harder and you listen to other people mm. and so on. Sure, that's I life. I know. would like, if you don't mind, to, to at the end of the interview, to come uh, shortly uh, back to two points that, uh, well, uh, made you in the middle of a storm sometimes. That's the Fourisson question and the Israel question. Mm -hmm. uh, let's not go into details, please, because the, the we details happen to be important. Yes, but I have only one question on the Fourisson question. Uh, uh, 
if I explain correctly, um, uh, Fouisson was a professor in Lyon in France. Uh, he uh, wrote a book and had a thesis that uh, concentration camps hadn't existed and he had a very different concept of the Second World War and the fate of the Jews from m most other historians. Uh, uh, you came in, uh, he, he was ousted, and uh, you came in with others and uh, came up for his right to be a professor there and up for his right to speak out. Uh, apart from that, you had a preface in his book which was used and your defense was uh, that you um, uh, tried to retract that uh, preface, but it was too late. That's what I, I but that read. But the facts are half, me? half true. I mean, do the facts matter or don't they matter? They, of course they do. Well, let me yeah. tell you what the facts are now. Uh -huh. The facts are that uh, uh, Forisson was a professor of French yeah. literature at Lyon, French literature at uh -huh. Lyon University. He published a few private pamphlets denying uh -huh. the existence of gas chambers. Uh, he was then suspended from teaching on the grounds that he could not be protected from violence. Mm -hmm. uh, he was then, uh, at that point, a, he was then brought to trial for a falsification of history. The book that you're referring to is entitled Memoir in Defense Against Those Who yeah. Accuse Me of Falsification of History on yeah. the Matter of Gas Chambers. It was, in fact, submit. I didn't know of its existence, but it was submitted to the tribunal, basically, the court for which he was tried for mm -hmm. falsification of history and later condemned. Now, how did I get involved in this? Well, some stage along the line, I was asked to sign a civil rights petition, mm -hmm. as I do thousands of times, mm -hmm. as I do for Salman Rushdie, which no doubt enrages the Ayatollah Khomeini. Which is a so different on. question. It's not a different Price question. put on his head by Sorry. a man. Yeah, but here, here's a case where uh, Price wasn't put on his head, he was actually punished. Huh. There's lots of differences. Uh, the, uh, in, in my view, see, uh, like in, uh, in my view, I, I do believe mm -hmm. in freedom of speech. I realize that's not a popular position mm -hmm. around here, but I believe in it. I share uh, the position. Okay, so fine. don't be now, afraid. If, uh, if, if, uh, see, I, uh, just as I defended people like, say, Henry Kissinger and Walt Rostow mm -hmm. when they came back, although I despise what they stand for, mm -hmm. when they came back, when Walt Rostow, one of the plant, mm -hmm. well, a real war criminal in my view, mm -hmm. when he came back to try to get a position back at MIT in 1969, I was, in fact, the spokesman for a group of students, radical students, if who they, said that if uh, he is being denied this position on political grounds, we're going to protest and demonstrate about it, because we think this war criminal has a right to teach. Would you have and, quit? Pardon? Would you have quit? I, if, if he had been turned down on political grounds, I might have, because I don't, see, I don't believe that people mm. should be turned down on political grounds, but my point is, that's a really controversial position, incidentally. Mm. The war was going on. We were talking about a man who was a war criminal and was going to continue well, research, which is be using... Now, okay. let's go back to I, Carson. I'm going to bridge it. Okay. So you were was but for but his right to, to let, let, free, free speech. I signed this. Yeah. Th there's a very, first of all, there's a very yeah. clear academic freedom issue, very clear. Mm -hmm. A man is prevented from teaching French literature because he wrote mm -hmm. a pamphlet about gas chambers. That is outrageous. Mm -hmm. uh, it couldn't have happened in the United States, I should say. Uh, he was then brought to trial for falsification of history, which is even more outrageous. Mm -hmm. He was actually condemned, which is even worse. Uh, I signed a petition calling on the tribunal to defend his civil rights. I was one of 500 signers. Mm -hmm. uh, at that point, the French press, which apparently has no conception of freedom of speech, uh, concluded that since I had called for his civil rights, I was therefore defending his theses. I was then, which is absurd, of course. Mm -hmm. Anyone who knows anything about civil rights knows that you're defend, typically defending freedom of speech for views you detest. There's no other point no, to do it. Now, let me go yeah, on. Yeah. Can I continue <laughs> with the facts? The yes, facts? you can c continue with the facts for hours, but, but, but I mean, but, but there, there are, are a few facts, facts that, yeah, okay. Well, let's get to the so-called yeah. preface. Huh? Uh, I was then asked by the person who organized the petition yeah. to write a statement on freedom of speech. Yeah. Just banal comments uh -huh. about freedom of speech, pointing out the difference between uh -huh. defending a person's right to express his views and defending the views expressed. So I did that. I wrote a rather banal statement called Some Elementary Remarks on Freedom of Expression, uh -huh. uh, and I told him, do what you like with it. Uh, at that point, Forrest Holmes was writing his memoir in defense, unknown to me, and my statement was added as a, an avis, as an opinion. It was attached to this statement in which he defended himself against Which wasn't asked from you before. No, but in fact, see, I can't really, I told him, do what you like with it. Hmm. I mean, I didn't, I didn't know about the hmm. book, but uh, actually, I think it was completely, like, for example, if Henry Kissinger was brought to trial for freedom of, uh, for falsification of history, I would have no objection to having something I wrote on freedom of speech attached to a memoir in which he defended himself from the charge, of course. Yeah. 
freedom of speech issues. You won't ask you, that's the difference. Well, okay, but I'm saying, but you know, I mean, freedom of speech issues are important, crucial, in fact, some of the most crucial issues. Yeah. So uh, when I learned, now, mm -hmm. those are the facts. Now, I'm, you know, in, in my view, now this my is a question. question of the now yeah. and trivial okay. issues. There's one, one simple question. Didn't you ask yourself afterwards whether it was very wise of you on your part to act at least like you were defending him and the I person instead of the right of free speech? No, because I never acted that way. No, I never were. defended him as a person. I don't even know. It was very I I I made people to incur oh, yes. it. Oh, that's true. You see, people who don't, I, I realized as soon mm -hmm. as I signed the petition that this is going to be interpreted by people who have not yet reached the Enlightenment. We're mm -hmm. still in the Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. It's going to be interpreted as a defense of his views. Of course I realize that. I understand the world. But freedom of speech issues are important, and I'm perfectly willing to But then them. why did you try at the last moment to get it back from that's the That's the one thing I'm sorry about. But the that's one the real, that's the no, real it's not. thing. It's not. Of course. Because, because, you, I tried to because in, with that you said it was wrong of you. No, I didn't. Do it. See, in fact, take a look at what I, I, I wrote a letter, which was mm -hmm. then publicized, in which I said, look, Things have reached the point mm -hmm. where the French intellectual community simply is incapable of understanding the issues. Mm -hmm. At this point, it's just going to confuse matters even more if my uh, comments on freedom of speech happen to be attached to this book, which I don't know, didn't know existed. So just to clarify things, I better separate them. Now, in retrospect, I think I probably shouldn't have done that. Mm -hmm. I should have just said, fine, then let it appear, because it ought to appear. Mm -hmm. But that's, uh, apart from that, uh, I regard this as not only trivial, but as compared with other positions I've taken on freedom of speech, invisible. Mm. This doesn't begin to compare with defending yeah. the rights of American war criminals uh. to do their work while that work is being used to murder and destroy. And, and it doesn't begin to compare with dozens of other cases. One last question, when you, I mean on this subject, um, when you uh, sti like to stick to facts, which I uh, in itself find, find very realistic, um, uh, why didn't it occur to you that maybe his facts were wrong? To put of course, it very his facts mildly. were wrong. Uh, I mean, but, that, but then you're irrelevant. Then you would have signed any other petition that you uh, wanted. But, I, but you, I mean, I can't even understand this question. Free speech for views you disapprove of, mm -hmm. then you believe in the principle. Yeah, that's the I, issue. I agree. Yeah, yeah, but but still. Therefore, I don't understand your question. When you said, why didn't it occur to me that maybe his views are wrong? Of course, it occurred. Well, to me. I knew it. You know, if you want yes, to read what I said, that was the reason that you finally tried to, to no, retract. The reason it. I retracted it was quite different. It was mm -hmm. that I realized at some point the French intellectuals cannot make the distinction. Who cares? Between who cares? Well, I agree, and that's why I say I shouldn't have even retracted. Hmm. Everything, that's the, hmm. as I said, that's, see, I, uh, that's the one thing that I regret, uh, but... Uh, you uh, regret your regret? Well, I regret the fact that I tried to accommodate uh, to the pre, to the middle, to the medieval character of French <laughs> intellectual life. Okay. And I should have not done that. I hmm. should have simply said, look, if you can't understand it, that's your problem. Hmm. And now, I, that's hmm. a very difficult position hmm. to make in Europe. I should say that an issue like this is almost inconceivable in the United States. In fact, there, there, there are examples very similar to Ferguson. There's a professor of engineering at uh, Northwestern University, mm. major university, who writes uh, books denying that the Holocaust took place. I mean, if he were deprived of the right to teach and brought to trial for mm. falsification of history, the country, there'd be a huge uproar over the country because there's a commitment to freedom of speech, and that mm. means freedom of speech for views that you detest. Mm. That's the only time when the view an issue agree. arises. Now, if a person can fail to, to distinguish between defending rights and defending mm. the theses expressed, they have to go back to the Middle Ages and start all over again. Mm. One question on Israel, the, uh, only one, in one the, I mean, not the history of Israel. Um, you, uh, I, I, even in this interview, call it a terrorist state, you, in the c connection the with the... Uh, state, uh, Terrorist, you said. Terrorist, terrorist states terrorist like state. Hong Kong, yeah. Korea. And, um, it is a terrorist state. Sorry? It is. I agree with you. Yeah, okay. So, mm -hmm. um, but that's not the question. The question is, um, when the majority of the Americans would, would regard Israel like it, and the majority of the people who, who have a say in government, what would you think would be the future of Israel? Well, I think Israel should be defended. In fact, I've written about this very clearly. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I think it's one of the most attractive societies in the world, despite, as I've written, despite the things that I've described. The world is a complicated place. A country yes. can be a terrorist state. Mm -hmm. Let's say the United States. 
The United States is a terrorist state. It also has the highest libertarian standards in the world. Hmm. Uh, well, that's so you know, life is complicated. Uh, life is complicated. Uh, 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 Israel is a small. I say I think the United States is doing great damage to Israel. The, for 20 years, the United States has effectively blocked the diplomatic settlement in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. uh, by doing so, it has contributed to placing Israel in a position of continued military confrontation, which I predicted 20 years ago, and I now agree, I think more strongly, mm -hmm. which is going to lead it to moral degeneration and ultimate destruction. And I'm not in favor of that. I actually have an emotional tie apart from an interest. I'd like to see the society preserved and improved, not destroyed. And I think that the insistence on military confrontation within the framework of maintaining a strategic asset in Israel is very wrong. Mm. That's why for 20 years I've been saying the United States should permit the diplomatic process, which it has repeatedly blocked. Uh, I could give you the details mm -hmm. if you like, but that's been happening. I would like it as well in this one. Yeah. Uh, a very last question. Um, uh, we began this interview with uh, the state of intellectuals, intellectualism, your state of intellectualism. Uh, aren't you ever getting tired of being an intellectual? Wouldn't you prefer to be something else, like a professor or something? I don't know. See, I don't take, I mean, I don't call myself an intellectual. No, but I other mean, people. Well, do. I don't care what people say. Uh, I mean, look, I have things that I think I can do and I think are worth doing. Mm. That's what I devote myself to. If people want to describe it the way they do, that's no, I mean, in a deeper sense. I think um, if I would be able to to convey something like that to you, um, uh, wouldn't it be very nice not to be an intellectual with all the responsibilities that go with it? Would it be nice to be a human being without the responsibilities of being a human being? Well, I can imagine that. Mm -hmm. For example, if you're a human being and you're a citizen of a relatively free society mm -hmm. and you're relatively privileged, you have responsibilities. Moral responsibilities are basically measured by what you are able to do. But I don't have any responsibility for things that happened in the 16th century because I can't do anything about them. I do have responsibility for things that I can influence. Uh, in, a, in a totalitarian society uh, where you've got the, you know, say, People extermination camps that, uh, there, there isn't much you can do. Well. In a free society, there's a lot you can do. Uh, for people like me who are relatively privileged, there's even more you can do. So that assigns you a responsibility mm. that you cannot escape. You can say, I don't care, you know, you can mm. do that. Uh, but you, but, but uh, you, you can't say, I don't have the responsibility. You can say, I refuse to execute the responsibility. Mm. That's a choice. Mm. Uh, and in some ways it's easier, in some ways it's harder. Don't forget you have to look yourself in the mirror every day too. Mm. Uh, and people make their choices. Nobody's a saint, I'm not. I don't spend 24 hours a day trying to help people. I do other things. Mm. Uh, but I adjust my life in some fashion so that I spend a fair amount of time, in fact, a lot of time, doing things that I think contribute to meeting a very substantial moral responsibility. And I think many other people do also, and that's what, you know, that's what's led to human progress. Mm. Uh, otherwise, we'd be still, you know, living in slave states. Mm. And do I think it's important. Do you recall what, what the, the biggest mistake in moral judgment was you ever made? I? The biggest mistake in moral judgment I ever made was waiting so long and getting involved in protest against the Vietnam War. I should have started it in 19, the early 1950s. Does that still weigh on you? Very much. Right. You know, I mean, look at the effect on Indochina, which was virtually mm. destroyed. Yes, I don't know if I could have made any no, difference, no, 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 but uh, one could uh, have tried at uh, least. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Professor Chomsky was that, but that have you forgotten. Thank you. I don't think that's no, something no, happening. No, no. <laughs> I assume this, something this silence is much more impressive. <laughs> <laughs> no, not, I'm not talking about the future. <laughs> I'm just taking my cues from you. Yeah. <laughs> Are we off camera? camera? I like it very much. You, yeah. I don't know about you, but. Uh, well. okay. Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Can I say something? Can I? Uh, at the introduction, you said that he's from Harvard. Oh, I heard that. Yeah. Oh, yes, that, that's true. Yeah. We'll believe it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I said MIT and Harvard. I said Harvard. Yeah. 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 Can I take this yeah. off? Yeah. That's it. Can I move this? Just wrap this here. I think so. Yes.
Thank you very much. Not really professional. Yeah. Two years ago, I was in England. And I met with all my left-wing friends, you know, and at that time there was an issue of a Chinese student at one of the polytechnic universities who yeah. was yeah. 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 apparently some racist or national yeah. yeah. whatever they call it, uh, and he was being beaten up and kept out of classes. And finally the university uh, insisted that he not attend classes. They made him attend classes alone in a separate yeah. building. I had a huge fight with all my left-wing friends about it. I thought this was outrageous. You know, and they thought it was terrific. You know, they were really yeah. proud of it. Okay, now you got the left wing saying, beat up this guy we don't like and keep him out of glasses. You got the right wing saying, kill a guy who blasphemes. Mm -hmm. What's left of freedom of speech? Yeah. You know, Nobody is for real. Freedom. Freedom. In fact, that's all over Europe. I mean, like Mitterrand made a uh, passionate speech about uh, the Rushdie affair, mm -hmm. uh, talking about how the deep commitment of France yes. to freedom of speech. Do you know what France had just yeah. done? Mm -hmm. no? France had just closed down an Algerian newspaper uh, on the grounds that uh, it was going to harm their relations with Algeria. Mm. They had just closed down a publisher because it was publishing vast yes, books. They, they there was had, no reaction. The American government France. has harassed this time Mother Jones yeah. and, 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 the, you know, and the, the United States yeah. almost every year refuses some people among the Nobel Prize winners to okay. even enter the country. Yeah. Yeah. Have next immigration, that's ridiculous. Yeah. Yes, but that's but government yeah. policy. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. I agree. Yeah. But on the particular, and that's why you can't give yeah. countries grades. You know, A, B, no. C. <laughs> what you do is point to always something bad. <laughs> and there's a, been a development in the United States that's extremely healthy. Mm -hmm. As a result of these popular struggles, a libertarian standard has been accepted, which is finally reasonable human beings. Mm -hmm. it, but by, by, it, it was not until 1964 that the Supreme Court struck down the seditious yeah. logic. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah. uh, in fact, pretty much yeah. 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 modern phenomenon. Up until the 1920s, of what Europe. But then it started going forward on that issue. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. in 1969, they took the Klan case recall. Yeah. They finally established what's probably the right standard that speech can be constrained only when it directly incites the crime. That's what can be said. Anything else there is yeah. theoretical. Yeah. No, there's plenty of things. That's up to who? To judge? Well, you know, yeah, that's the problem. problem. There's always going to be complicated. Of course. And then but the question is what standard is. Yeah. Okay, the question is what standard is. Now, in the United States, it is inconceivable that the government could decide to close a newspaper because it's harming their relations with them. It's inconceivable that somebody could be tried for falsification of history or for, or, or for distributing false news, as just happened in Canada. You know, it would laugh. Uh, and that's important. And it's also true, as you said before, that people can get into the United States. Well, you know, world's complex. That's part of the But on this issue, on the freedom of speech issue, which is crucial, that's essential to free society. On that issue, the United States is alone. Against my will, I have to leave him waging for that reason. I don't know. Pani generał Pałkę? Ja.
Were you shooting beta cam? No. Were you recording beta, beta cam? Yes, beta cam in Spain. Aha, good. I need to buy a few beta cam tapes. We're running short. Let me get a small one. Like this? No, 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 different. Thank you. 